Okay, I think we can start if everyone is, uh, is ready and uh, uh, our uh, team will uh, um, our team will admit additional attendees once they are arriving. On behalf of uh, Cardiovascular Research and uh, Council for Basic and uh, Basic Cardiovascular Sciences of the European Society of Cardiology, uh, namely on myself, uh, on my own behalf and uh, behalf of Christian Weber, I would like to welcome uh, uh, everyone to uh, our next uh, Cardiovascular Research Discoveries series uh, uh, talks. Uh, during today's uh, meeting, uh, we will we have an honor to uh, host uh, uh, Professor Thomas Eschenhagen and uh, Professor uh, Dr. Ronald Vagnozzi, uh, who will uh, discuss uh, the problems of cardiac repair and regeneration uh, with their uh, huge and very significant contributions in this field. As you know, this area is one of the really uh, of extremely high interest for cardiovascular research. And please uh, remember to submit your best work to our journal and uh, uh, always uh, try to uh, get new insights uh, from uh, us uh, about uh, this topic and many other topics. As you remember, uh, the way we organize these seminars is we invite a, a, a icon of uh, uh, the uh, area that is being discussed, uh, who uh, today will be Thomas Eschenhagen, and a, a person who is now uh, also very significantly contributing through major uh, publications uh, uh, to the field, uh, and that is uh, Ronald. At the end of both talks, we are expecting to have uh, about 20, 25 minute vivid discussion. Please place your questions in question and answer uh, a segment of uh, Zoom, and uh, we will be happy to uh, bring them up and discuss with our speakers. With this, uh, I would like to once again welcome you and transfer the chair to uh, Professor Christian Weber. Christian. Yeah, Tom, thank you very much for the kind opening and introduction. Well, it's a great honor and, and delight for me as a member of the German Cardiovascular Research Center to introduce Thomas Eschenhagen. Um, actually, he might not need much introduction, but I'll, I'll try my best anyway. Thomas is a real, true scholar and gentleman in the best sense uh, that he's uh, encyclopedically educated and interested in all uh, topics of life and science in particular. He's been very active uh, as a scientist and as a reviewer for the uh, DFG, for the German uh, Research Foundation as an ERC Advanced Grant uh, Awardee and also as an editor of Circulation. He is basically single-handedly, I would almost say, but at least single-handedly in, in terms of his vision, uh, built the, the structure of the German Cardiovascular uh, Research Center as it stands now as a role model for many other uh, German health centers and in particular also in that he has taken great uh, care to advocate for, the, for the, the mentoring of young scientists. And this is also something that this is about. And um, it's also an honor of, uh, at the side that I got to know my wife, thanks to his uh, efforts in, in bringing her to the uh, German Cardiovascular Research Center. Beyond all that, in terms of research, um, uh, Thomas has uh, um, produced seminal works uh, pioneering the field of uh, cardiac repair and regeneration. So, for instance, the use of uh, engineered uh, heart tissue uh, grafts uh, for cardiac repair, and as of late, also the, the role and use of inducible uh, pluripotent stem cells in, in cardiac regeneration. And so with this, Thomas, we very much look forward to receiving some new, new insights uh, from your talk. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for this uh, too generous uh, intro. And uh, Thomas, very much, thank you very much for the uh, Invitation. It's a, indeed a pleasure to give this seminar today with Ron, who's, whose work I really uh, like a lot. Um, and I try to look for the time here that I start doing this correctly. Um, let's see whether I can start here. Um, can you? Can you see? Oh, but I, uh, yeah, you can see, you just need to uh, go to- Is it okay now? Yeah, perfect. Very good. Okay, so it's it's a pleasure to talk about this subject. I uh, titled uh, my talk, Remuscularizing the Injured Heart, Raft Size Matters. And just as an intro, I, I should disclose that we entered a, a partnership with Evotech uh, for the de development of this 
uh, approach. So that should be said. The background, I think, is known to everybody. The clinical problem, and I think it's really one of the central clinical problems in, in cardiology, is that any loss of heart muscle is irreversible. And if you see a heart section like that, it is very difficult to, uh, to um, imagine that by giving any kind of drug, you can restore such a heart. So as Thomas said, this has been and is still regeneration, uh, a very active area of research. And since Thomas is very polite, he didn't say it's also a very controversial area of research. And some years ago, uh, I made an attempt to put different people with really quite different opinions on one table, uh, not only the same of one group, but uh, different groups. And we came up with this consensus statement, which is actually pretty, if you will, disappointing, because it's kind of going back to where we have been 20 years ago. There is probably a very low cardiac myocytes turnover in the normal adult human heart. Bone marrow cells do not transdifferentiate into cardiac myocytes. There are essentially no resident stem or progenitor cells that contribute to cardiomyogenesis, but there are positive effects of cell therapy. And that argues for likely paracrine, or as Ron is going to convince you, immunological in, in, uh, as cause. So um, if you see again this heart with so many scars, I think one solution remains, it's uh, namely to, to bring back muscle. So to remuscularize the heart. And there are at least three strategies where, which I think really can uh, do something. This is to stimulate the very low existing endogenous cardiac myocyte proliferation rate. The second, to convert non-myocytes such as fibroblasts to myocytes. And the third one, to apply new myocytes, cardiac tissue, and that's something we uh, were involved with over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. So if you go back to this consensus paper, it says to this point, transplantation of myocytes derived from pluripotent stem cells can generate new myocardium that beats in synchrony with the host myocardium and may contribute to systolic force generation. And then comes an important side sentence, although the extent of this contribution has not been precisely determined. And I think that's still true. And if you think about an effect as a pharmacology, uh, as a pharmacologist, you obviously think about Paracelsus who said, about 500 years ago, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. The dosage alone makes it so a thing is not a poison. So dosage is something which is very, very central to pharmacology. And that's why I called, I, I turned my, my talk like that. And I looked a little bit in the literature what has been done in terms of dosing. And the group of uh, La Flamme and Murray in the, I think one of the first papers in 2005 uh, showed this one here. Those response studies were performed in rats. Uh, they received 0.5, 1.15 1 and 10 million uh, ES cell derived myocytes and were examined. And the results were no grafts were detected in rats receiving the lowest dose, 0.5 million. And only a single small graft was observed in the rats receiving 1 million. In contrast, grafts were present in the vast majority of hearts receiving 5 or 10 million cells, but no clear increase in graft size was seen at the highest dose. So this argues for a minimum dose without a clear dose dependency. This is 2005, now we are 20 years, 15 years later, and there are beautiful studies, I would say, mainly from the uh, Marie Laflamme group, in, in the meantime, in non-human primates. And I showed the three most important papers here. You see, these were xenogenic transplantations in infarcted macaque hearts, mainly done after two weeks. And they used either 1,000 million or 400 million or 750 million 
for something like a 40 gram heart. And the representative result is shown here, always in green, you see the graft in this infarcted macaque heart. And I would say this is quite impressive. A nice degree of new myocardium, mainly analyzed after 12 weeks. And functionally, or what is um, statistically, they showed a graft size of about 40% of scar, 15% of scar, 10% of scar. And this was associated with a 10% absolute increase in ejection fraction, which I would uh, consider relevant. Here, the, 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 the injury was so small that they didn't see any function. So, and this was uh, in, in few animals, but it's, I think, relatively clear. So around 10, 15% of the scar is the graft size and 10% absolute increase in um, function. However, there was another paper in macaques, in a very large group of macaques, which actually in the end concluded that these cells, first of all, did not remain. They were undetectable after 100, 140 days. There was no graft and still a very small increase in injection fraction. However, I have to say, this study is funny because they used 10 million, so 100 times less. And this, of course, it's a, it's a very low dose, 0.25 million per gram. And that is not surprising that um, there is nothing left. So I would say this study does not argue that it doesn't work. They just argues that there is a minimum. You need to probably reach grafts which are 10% and more, and therefore you need at least 10 million per gram myocardium. That is something what these studies suggest, which is quite a high number if you uh, think that the human heart is 400 gram, 300 to 400. This is a very high number of cells. I also wanted to show you this paper because it's kind of putting some water in the wine. Again, La Flamme's group, this time pigs, so a real human heart, a human-like heart, 150 gram heart. They use 1,000 million cardiac myocytes, which is a dose of 6.6 .6 million per gram. They did show a respectable graft size, but they didn't see any effect on left ventricular ejection fraction. Maybe because they injected three weeks after MI, so in a relatively chronic phase, and we will discuss about this maybe later. What everybody showed in these large hearts is that injection of myocytes induced quite significant arrhythmia. They were transient over a few weeks, but they were all there, and in the case of the pigs, some pigs died. So this is clearly a drawback. So I would summarize, this uh, injection of myocytes works. It has a high washout rate, low efficiency. It gives arrhythmias, and the effect in large animals is not established really yet. With, re uh, with regard to the high washout rate, I found this approach by the Fukuda group in Japan quite interesting. They assembled the myocytes to spheres, which you see here on the left, and then they in, um, constructed this injection device and showed that in this form, they get a much higher retention rate. So maybe that's an interesting way forward. Obviously, we do something else. We, we use this tissue engineering approach. And an alternative to our approach is these stacked monolayers, again, uh, mainly done in Japan. And we developed this engineered hard tissue. And I'm going to show you some data of this. So we make beating cardiac tissues from IPS-derived myocytes. And then we uh, transplanted these muscle strips on injured guinea pig hearts. And you see maybe here below, this was one week after a cryo injury, you see the injury below. Then we tried to suture these strips onto the surface of the heart in a way that it is anchored in the healthy myocardium. You see here micro CT, you see a big scar, transmural. So this is more or less after transplantation. And then four weeks later, we were happy to see quite relevant scar uh, uh, grafts. So you see seven examples here. Uh, the best one is shown here in A. You see uh, right ventricle, the septum, the left ventricle. You see the large 
scar in white. And then in the scar, this graft, and this is clearly human as shown in the, with this beautiful Q80 antibody, which stains uh, human nuclei red. You see as well, by the way, this for, for Thomas in the vascularization, the blood vessels, they're all negative. So they all come from the host, it's very clear. And the fibroblasts actually as well, they come from the host. So this graft size was associated with an increase in function. This was a relatively large cohort of animals. So I think hopefully solid statistics. The fractional area change before injury was about 42%. It went down with the injury to about 28 or so percent. Then we randomized this big group in three, EHT group, cell-free and endothelial cells only. And you see only in this group, we saw statistically significant increase in function, but of course also quite a scatter, which is classical in these experiments. One of the questions we answered is, we tried to answer is, is this increase in function associated with coupling? And the answer is yes, sometimes. So you see that here, we did this with voltage dye of Langendorf perfused hearts. This is a remote in black and the transplanted graft area in green. You see the synchrony here between these at four Hertz, but at seven Hertz, there was a only partial coupling between the host and the graft, which argues for some kind of insufficient or, or not stable um, coupling. And this may be related to the fact that we and others with these patches never see arrhythmias. So here is a study in 10 animals and we tried with telemetry and we didn't see really absolutely anything. In red, you see the EHT group and in, in, in black, the control group. Of course, we see arrhythmias, but there's no change, but no difference between the groups. So this was uh, some years ago and I wanted to show you some things about those. First of all, we optimized the, the geometry because obviously these strips were not perfect. They, they did not perfectly cover the surface. So we made this uh, more, uh, this type, type, of, type of geometry, which is 2.5 by 1.5 centimeters, so it's much bigger with the pores. And this resulted in a very nice tissue development. You see this over time of development in the dish. Initially, it's a big tissue, and then day five, 10, and 20, the tissue remodels and forms over time. And this was uh, associated with very nice dense tissue development, quite surprising. But I think the, these pores have two effects. They increase diffusion and they increase the number of force lines. So this uh, provides uh, the basis for this very dense tissue development. And also, if you look, if you go more into the tissue and you look at the, the structure of the cells, so this is in 2D cardiac typically like an egg at, at 21 days. So it, uh, it gets better, it gets bigger, but still it's completely unoriented. While the actinine staining, the orientation gets much better in these patches. It looks pretty much not adult, but going into this direction. Quite rewarding. Okay, so now what, what about doses? We did a big study, um, again in cryo-infarcted uh, cryo guinea pig hearts, and we used either no uh, cell-free uh, patches or a dose of uh, about four, eight, and 12 million myocytes. And this is how it looks after implantation. It covers the entire surface of the guinea pig heart, and here it's four weeks later, pretty nicely integrated into the surface. To make this a fair um, comparison, we change two parameters. We, we, we change the cell density. We cannot go down too much because otherwise it doesn't beat anymore. So this was uh, just a little less per milliliter. And in addition, we, we changed the size. And like this, we came to these different doses. And we, we think this is a fair comparison. Um, 
this is our nicest case. This was really a fantastic uh, graft, uh, but um, I can tell you that it was not always so beautiful. But you, you see, sometimes you really these very big grafts again on the scar, on and in the scar. You see its human origin with the red, and it has a pretty nice, dense calicomycetes structure. Um, this is more statistically correct. That's how it looks. So we did it systematically with every single uh, animal. We did many animals, I think more than 100, from the base to the apex. And these are representative examples. And you see here a very small graft, for example, in dose one, and bigger grafts in dose three. Statistically, it gave more or less the expected result. Why the scar size between these three, the four groups didn't differ, it's about 25% scar size. The graft size showed a nice, even scattering, but still nice dose dependency. And this correlated quite well with the number of human myocytes in the sections. So now, of course, the big question was, what about function? I personally thought that, um, even the smaller function would have done something, but the answer is unfortunately not. So you see here always echo before and after injury and four weeks after implantation. Relevance, I would say relevant group sizes. And this is no cells, this is low dose, middle dose, and only the high dose gave the expected benefit. So there was no effect. In this graph, even though in this group, even though the, the graph, there were some graphs, like 5%, but apparently that's not enough. And um, so I think that the data are clear. Um, we looked uh, for markers of maturation, and I think I, I'm not going to bore you with all this data, but just to show you some, uh, for example, it's interesting to see that over time of transplantation, there's a clear increase in MLC2V, so the ventricular made mature uh, isoform, and the other one, A, goes to almost down to zero. So we have in the graft almost nothing left. So they go towards maturation over time. And they are vascularized, even though the capillary density compared to the host is about a factor of five fold lower. And we don't know exactly what that means. It may be meaningful. Um, yeah, the data are clear and it doesn't depend um, too much on the dose between dose two and three. There was not a real difference. Uh, Sarcomere length is the same. The maturation is no different. And um, what is important is that uh, we also did a time dependency study. So we wanted to see what happens directly after transplantation and then over time. And what you see here, these are the tissues we implant. Nice tissue structure, longitudinal orientation, no problem. But then after one week, it looks really horrible. I mean, this is uh, almost a complete loss of actinin striation. So the sarcomeres are disassembled and then two weeks later, it starts to be better, and four weeks later, it's much better. So there's a degeneration, regeneration phase, and this is also um, associated with the increase in overall cell number and proliferation. The group of Sean Harding did very similar things, not a dose dependency study, but a principal study in um, LAD infarcted rabbit heart. They used our patches and found essentially the same. So we feel that this is kind of a reproducible thing. So we feel safe to go forward. And now we devised a huge patch, a real big patch, like five by seven centimeters. This is half a billion uh, myocytes in. They, they're actually quite nice. And yesterday there was just an implantation in Munich in, in, in a pig. Um, until now, we are not quite happy with the immunology of the pigs, but we still hope that we find a good condition. But at least we, I think we are on the way. And with this, I would like to summarize at this point. Um, I think it is pretty clear that pluripotent stem cells 
are the only source of real new myocytes at a relevant number. It is easy to produce billions of these cells. The injection of suspended myocytes is simple but relatively inefficient and arrhythmogenic. The 3D approaches are more complicated but may be more efficient, at least in terms of graft size per cell number. And we could show now that uh, you need a minimum of 4 million myocytes per gram, which is about 2.5 fold less than with the injection to get an effect. In my view, there's still a lot of open questions. So I, I'm not sure whether it's really ready to go for the clinic. There are other people with different opinion, because I think the mechanism of benefit remains to be not completely clear. Is it really the new contractor muscle mass? What about the coupling, which is certainly an issue? There are many more or less good papers showing that the effect may be less good in chronic injury. And we can discuss about this because there's also interesting evidence that also the pro-proliferative interventions are less or no effective in chronic injury. And I think personally, we cannot go to the patient with immunosuppression. So we have to go for this hypoimmunogenic. And um, there are many papers now showing that this is in principle possible. I should just show you one example, a nature biotechnology paper from Sonja Schrepfer, who is partially in Hamburg and partially in San Francisco and founded the company now. She knocked out MHC1 and MHC2 and overexpressed CD47, I think, an anti anti-immune response uh, gene. So that's an interesting way forward. Others are active. I really value the work of Charles Murray, Chuck Murray with the ES cell myocytes, his former postdoc La Flamme and Blue Rock go for also for hypoimmunogenic. Fukuda goes for the spheres, Saba goes for the sheets and my former postdoc Zimmermann goes for something very similar to us, the, the EHT patches, but wants to do this allogenic. What is probably important for the field is that big pharma starts to go in, like Bayer and Genentech. Um, you may have heard that Wolfram Zimmermann treated his first patient a few weeks ago with his patches in a study which is supported by the German center. Um, we can discuss about this. Um, it's, an, it's, it's, it's quick. And uh, as I said, we, are ent we entered this uh, partnership with Evotech because via Evotech, we get access to these hypoimmunogenic cells, which as I said, personally, I think that's uh, a safer way forward. And with this, I would like to really uh, end and thank my group. It's really, a, I'm very happy to have a super active and dedicated group. Not all of this work is easy. Um, making billions of miles is possible, but sometimes it doesn't work and it can be quite frustrating. So it's Florian Weinberger, who is really spearheading this. Many important students and technicians. Birgit Gertz does an echo. We have good collaboration with the surgeons because that's important and several international um, collaboration, not as last in Glasgow, Godfrey Smith and Anne Kelly and others. So with this, I would like to thank, time is okay. Thank you for the attention. I'm very happy to discuss later after Ron's talk. Shall I stop? I guess. Yes, so. please. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice uh, presentation of, of all these uh, new developments that inspire hope. Uh, uh, in relation to, to cardiac regeneration that, as you emphasized, has been a few times shaken, but uh, is coming back. And I think it will be a great topic to discuss uh, later. Um, thank you again. Uh, and uh, at this uh, time, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ronald Vagnozzi, uh, who is an assistant professor at the University of uh, Colorado Anschluss Medical Campus. Uh, he received PhD in 2013 from Thomas Jefferson University, 
and was awarded several uh, key awards from uh, AHA, including the, uh, um, the Melvin Marcus Early Career Investigator Award. He studies uh, mainly uh, uh, inflammation and uh, uh, immunity uh, a role in wound healing and in, in repair. And the uh, uh, current goal of his research, I understand, is to understand the regulatory mechanisms of cardiac wound healing this, with discovery of novel approaches to repair and rejuvenation of damaged heart. Ronald. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Let me share my screen. So again, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's a real pleasure to present today. It's a real privilege to follow Dr. Eschenhagen, uh, who really helped set the stage for what I'll try to talk about today, uh, which is really some data that uh, I'll show you from my postdoctoral work with Jeff Mulkinton, where we tried to address the mechanism of adult stem or progenitor cell therapy for heart repair. And in doing so, I think we've uncovered something quite interesting, uh, which I'll try to convince you of as therapeutic inflammation. Uh, it's the idea that by stimulating innate immune cell activity, you can actually promote, if not regeneration of the heart, perhaps rejuvenation. Uh, so I'll walk you through some of our, our, our thinking with that. Uh, so as you just heard, the, the, the idea of trying to regenerate or restore lost cardiomyocytes has been a, a real holy grail in the field for quite some time. Uh, and really this breaks down into two major categories, as you've already heard, there's ways to induce the proliferation of existing myocytes uh, or replace them with cell therapy, uh, either ES cells or IPS cells, as you've heard about engineered heart tissues or reprogram other uh, somatic cells into cardiomyocytes. Uh, and all of these are, are really under active investigation. Uh, but what I'll talk about is this, this concept that really took hold of the field and became quite interesting for a number of years, which was the idea that, that adult tissues have intrinsic stem cells that can be isolated and then re-injected into a damaged heart uh, and repopulate it with robust amounts of new myocytes. Uh, and what I'm showing you here are just a, a, a collection of some of the major cell types that had been proposed uh, and the idea was that, again, you could isolate these cells from uh, donor animals, re-inject re re them or re-deliver them in other ways, and that they would restore lost uh, muscle tissue. And so this idea of adult stem cell therapy, which is the kind of cell therapy I'll be talking about, uh, was that you could transplant these cells with stem or progenitor-like properties to restore lost cardiomyocytes. Uh, and as you've already uh, heard a little bit about, this became a very contentious and very hotly debated topic. There were a number uh, of clinical trials and countless animal studies that, that tried this with a whole bunch of different cell types. Uh, and around the time that we became interested in this about seven or eight years ago, uh, there was a really a lot of, of question in the field in terms of clinical application, but also in terms of mechanism uh, and how, how these cells might actually be delivering a therapeutic benefit. And the reason for this is that while these cells were originally thought to have robust myogenic potential, uh, we really found that actually that this is not the case and that most, if not all of these cell types are rapidly cleared from the heart uh, and do not really turn into robust numbers of cardiac myocytes. Uh, and this was described uh, as Professor Eschenhagen showed in the consensus statement a few years back. Uh, but really the question that remained in the field was all of these cell types and animal models have functional benefit when they're delivered in various contexts after MI injury, uh, and how does this work? Uh, if these cells are not really persisting to any great extent, if they're not turning into muscle, what's the explanation for the, 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 the transient but also sometimes significant functional benefit that was seen? And how does it work with so many different cell types of so many different origins uh, and biological properties? So that's the question we really tried to address uh, when I was in the Mulkington lab. And the, <clears throat> the way we tried to do this was really to take a relatively straightforward approach uh, to use wild type mice, C57 mice, and then inject these cells directly into an otherwise uninjured heart. So into healthy uh, wild type hearts. The idea being that by doing so, we could uncover the, the fundamental effect of what these cells might be doing. Do they turn into muscle? Do they turn into vasculature? Do they persist? What really happens when you directly inject these cells into the myocardium? And the data I'll show you today are from bone marrow mononuclear cells or MNCs. Uh, and we did this with a number of cell types. Um, 
But we focused on MNCs because at the time, these were the major cell type being used clinically. And they were really the, the cell type that launched this concept of adult stem cell therapy uh, in the early 2000s. <clears throat> and these cells we used were labeled with a genetic reporter uh, with membrane tomato so we could track them. So the, the cells will be red. And we simply injected these at defined regions along the LV and follow them out uh, over two weeks to just assess retention, differentiation, and uh, tissue response. And to make a long story short, what we found is that when we injected these cells into the otherwise healthy muscle, uh, they caused a robust innate immune response uh, characterized by the accumulation of activated macrophages, which are stained here in green with CD68. And as you can see, uh, the nice thing about this model is that you can easily localize these injection sites because the rest of the tissue is otherwise unaltered and they're very regional. Uh, so with our saline injection, you do get a small amount of in inflammation, um, but with MNCs, which you can see here in red, and this is at three days post-injury or post-injection rather, uh, you get a robust accumulation of macrophages. So this, this was the major response of injecting MNCs into the, into the mouse heart. And so to mimic this without a cell, we wanted to know, does this inflammatory response really drive the, the functional benefit that, we, that was seen with cell therapy? And so we settled on a compound called zymosin, which is a component of the yeast backbone, and it's a toll-like receptor agonist. So it's a highly inflammatory agent uh, that was also fluorescently tagged, so we could track it when it was injected. And it gave us a very similar response. It, we could see an accumulation of CD68 macrophages, around the area of injection. So now we have a model of the inflammatory effect of cell therapy uh, that's, not a, that's non cellular. <clears throat> so when we look at this a little more closely over a time course, the other important thing, and we, we'll come back to this uh, towards the end, is that these cell injections, because they get cleared from the heart, uh, are tr the response is transient. So the, the immune response we saw in terms of macrophage accumulation in the area of injection uh, really only lasted about three to seven days. Um, and then after this, it was, it was largely cleared. And you can see that this was coordinated with the clearance of the cells from the tissue or the zymosin molecule. So we, we saw the same sort of response with zymosin. So this, this response is acute. It's localized to the area of injection. Uh, it's predominated by macrophage activity, although other immune cells uh, could also be playing a role. Uh, and it coordinates with the loss of the cells. <clears throat> So the big question for us was, does this uh, immune response recapitulate the functional improvement of injecting MNCs into the infarct at rodent heart? And so to do this in a somewhat more clinically relevant model, we used ischemia reperfusion injury, where we did a two hour uh, coronary ligation and release. And then one week after injury, so in, in the presence of, a, of an initially formed scar, we then went back in and re-injected either MNCs or the zymosin compound and then follow these mice out for an additional eight weeks for, to look at cardiac function and remodeling. And essentially what we found is in the control group, you can see the depression of cardiac function by fractional shortening. Uh, and it, by two weeks post-therapy, both the MNC treated group and the zymosin treated group showed recovery, improvement in cardiac function compared to IR alone. And the interesting thing was that even though we already know that this response itself is transient, that the immune reaction is, is cleared, even by eight weeks post ther therapy, we still saw a benefit in the groups that received either MNCs or zymosin. Although you can see uh, that function does continue to deteriorate. So this is not really a regenerative effect, it's more of a rejuvenating effect. Um, but again, you can get the same benefit by injecting this zymosin compound versus MNCs. And then in some data that I don't have time to show you, we did a number of complementary experiments uh, to, to see really if this immune response was really the driving force behind uh, the mechanisms of cell therapy. Uh, first, we actually tested uh, intentionally killed, heat killed cells. Um, so we used MNCs that we had freeze thawed to create a cell slurry. Uh, we injected that and saw the same benefit as live cells. Uh, we gave these mice broad spectrum immunosuppression by cyclosporin and saw that that blunted uh, or essentially ameliorated the effect of both cells and zymosin. And then more specifically, we use quadrinate liposomes to ablate macrophages. And again, this resulted in, a, in an attenuation of the effect of cell therapy uh, or zymosin post IR. So really this immune response seems to be the key driver of, of how these cell injections are working. And so we became interested in the mechanism of this and specifically how the macrophage phenotype might be playing a role. 
Uh, and this is a highly oversimplified diagram, but the, the point I'd like to make is that it's well known that in response to cardiac injury, uh, there's a biphasic accumulation of macrophage phenotypes uh, that's driven by an initial influx of inflammatory monocytes and macrophages that are largely driven by chemokine receptor 2 signaling. And then there's a second wave of reparative macrophages, uh, which are driven by a number of cues, but seem to be uh, largely high expressing of this other chemokine receptor, CX3CR1. So we decided to test whether this paradigm was occurring in the response to cell therapy. And to do this, we took advantage of reporter mice where CX3CR1 macrophages in green are labeled with GFP and CCR2 macrophages in red are labeled with RFP. And this is a real-time reporter uh, system. So it tells us when these cells are actually expressing the, the chemokine receptor of interest. And in healthy mice, as you might expect, the myocardium is populated primarily by these resident CX3CR1 macrophages with very few CCR2 monocytes and macrophages present. <clears throat> and then what we saw with, with MNC injection, and again, this is in otherwise healthy animals, is that injecting these cells gives us a very similar response to what occurs here and that you essentially get an acute influx of CCR2 monocytes and macrophages early on, and then a shift to this sort of mixed population of both CX3CR1, reparative macrophages, and CCR2 monocytes and macrophages. And so the immune response to cell therapy is not, seemingly is not unique. It actually recapitulates the intrinsic wound healing that, that normally occurs um, in the heart, at least in terms of the macrophage response. And so to look at this a little more carefully, what we did is we used knockout mice for either CCR2 uh, or CX3CR1 to see what happens if we intentionally shift these populations or, or alter their function. The cell, the cell therapy still, still work in the same way. So here we used global CCR2 knockout mice or global CX3CR1 knockout mice. Uh, same model, we did IR injury. And then one week later, we injected MNCs and tracked the, the function over time. What we found is that by, by doing this and by deleting these key chemokine receptors, we could really uh, polarize or shift the response to cell therapy post IR in these, in these mice. In the wild type condition, again, you can see depressed cardiac function with IR injury that's restored with MNCs as we've shown before. Uh, the CCR2 knockout mice and, and several groups have already shown this, they're already protected from injury. The, the loss of CCR2 really results in the, the uh, downregulation of, of monocyte accumulation and really protects these animals uh, through other mechanisms. So we saw that too. But then interestingly, with cell therapy, there was no additional benefit. So, so in the setting of CCR2 deficiency, um, these hearts are already sort of you know, polarized towards a healing response, and the MNCs really didn't do anything added to that. Uh, in contrast, the CX3CR1 mice are very interesting. Uh, at baseline, they really responded similarly to wild type, but cell therapy had no effect in this setting. And so by, by disrupting the behavior or activity of these CX3CR1 macrophages, we no longer saw a benefit from MNC injection. And then we wanted to go again a little bit further and try to understand where's this functional improvement coming from? If the response is transient, if it's not making new muscle, what's the explanation for an improvement in, in cardiac function? And we think one of the key drivers of this is changes of the extracellular matrix and changes of the scar itself. Uh, when we did these injections, we saw that, that in the border zone of the IR treated hearts uh, with MNCs, we saw an attenuation of, of fibrosis by picoserious red. Uh, I'll also point out we saw the same response with, uh, with non-viable cells. So again, an attenuation of fibrosis. We also saw a down regulation of a number of ECM components, including collagens, fibronectin, periostin, and other modifying enzymes. However, this was in the presence of the same uh, scar size. So we didn't attenuate scar size or, or scar burden. We just, we think we've changed the actual composition of the ECM. And this is something that I'm act actively uh, pursuing in future studies. I'll tell you a little bit about at the end. And then the other interesting thing we did, and this was a collaboration uh, with the uh, Saudi Yapin lab at, at University of Cincinnati, we did muscle mechanics on isolated infarct strips. And so this was uh, sort of a unique uh, sort of assay that, that we try where we attach these uh, infarcted heart strips to a muscle rig and we measured their passive force production over increasing length, length as an idea of trying to get a sense of, is the mechanics of the infarct altered? Um, so we saw that with cell therapy in blue, uh, we saw an improvement in passive force production compared to IR alone in red. 
And these, these infarct strips started behaving more like wild type uninjured heart, which is shown as an example here with these uh, little gray dots. So we think that not only did we change the properties of the, of the scar in terms of its ECM composition, we might have also changed its ability to passively uh, com contract during, during um, cardiac function. And then how does this tie into macrophages? Uh, this is something that, again, that I'm very interested in and we'll tell you a little bit about what we're thinking uh, in the next few slides. But we think that those macrophage phenotypes, those, those different subsets that I talked about, actually impose differential effects on cardiac fibroblasts. And so to look at this a little bit, we isolated either CCR2 macrophages from the, the IR injured mouse heart, in, uh, which were labeled with this RFP, or we isolated CX3, CR1 macrophages uh, labeled with GFP by uh, uh, fact sorting. And then we co-cultured these with primary cardiac fibroblasts and just measured fibroblast gene expression over time. And what you can see here is that CCR2 inflammatory macrophages give a, a pro-fibrotic pro effect and that they induce expression of things like lysyl oxidase, smooth muscle actin, and collagen. Uh, whereas the CX3, CR1 macrophages do not do so and perhaps even modestly suppress uh, expression of, of pro-fibrotic or myofibroblast genes. Uh, this was all done without any other stimulus on board. And so we're, we're actively interested in testing whether the CX3, CR1 macrophages might actually suppress pro-fibrotic signaling in the presence of things like TGF-beta or, or stretch. Um, but again, the idea here is that these macrophage subsets actually impose differential fibroblast regulation, uh, which may either directly or indirectly translate to changes in ECM content, uh, maturation, and, and therefore uh, the compliance of the ECM. So what I've shown you so far is that despite not producing new numbers of cardiac myocytes, adult stem cell therapy does impart a significant functional benefit in rodents uh, that we were able to show, and, and along with several other groups have shown this over the years. But we think that the, the driver of this response is the acute inflammatory uh, effect of injecting these cells. Uh, and that they, this macrophage response that they induce, which recapitulates normal wound healing, but perhaps in a, in a more of a microcosm in a controlled way, is the rejuvenating signal that we, that we think underlies the effect of, the, of cell therapy. And one of the key mechanisms that we think is driving this is that the macrophage response does recondition the ECM and alters the elastic properties of the scar. Uh, and perhaps this is directly uh, through altering the effects of cardiac fibroblasts. Uh, it's also important to point out that we don't rule out a role for paracrine signaling in this rejuvenating process. Uh, although we were able to recapitulate it with an immune stimulus uh, without cells, there may also be additional cues that are playing a role here as well. Uh, and so this is something that we're also interested in. But really our, what we think now is that cardiac cell therapy is reactivating the heart's intrinsic wound healing cascade, at least in the, in the context of adult cells that are not uh, remuscularizing the heart. So what are some of the implications of this? And so I'll just quickly show you a few pieces of, of newer data. We think that some of this mechanism, because it is localized to the area of, of, of injection and to the border zone of the scar, we think that this might help explain some of the, the difficulties and controversies with clinical application, because in many cases, uh, MNCs or other cell types were systemically infused into patient, uh, into the vasculature uh, with the idea that they would home to the heart. Uh, this is changing with some newer trials, but really we wanted to test this uh, in our model. And so we infused either 1 million MNCs uh, via tail vein, or we did our direct injection again uh, with one tenth the dose. And we tracked retention over time and we tracked cardiac function. And, and as you can see, and has been discussed in, in other, other um, papers, we really didn't see any accumulation or retention of infused MNCs. They were rapidly cleared from the blood within minutes. Uh, they never really made it to the heart or other organs. Uh, and then a few times that we did find an MNC labeled in the heart uh, with this membrane tomato, it was, it was really stuck in a capillary. So these cells are not really getting into the, the area of injury. Uh, and what we found is that by infusing 1 million MNCs, we really did not see an improvement in cardiac function after IR, but if we directly injected one tenth of that into the border zone, similar to our other, our other findings, we did see an improvement. The other uh, component of this that we think is important is the actual nature and maturity of the scar itself at the time of therapy. And so when we did our studies, we injected it one week post IR and we did see a functional improvement. These are the same data that I've shown you before, just regraphed here. 
And so we went back and we did the same experiment with direct injection of MNCs, but we waited eight weeks. And so we waited till the scar was fully, fully formed and mature. And then we went back and did our injection. And at that time, we really did not see any benefit. And we think one of the reasons for this might be that in these chronic scars, uh, the ECM is already really fully altered and, and, and it's very different in terms of composition. And one of the ways we've looked at this is by staining for this collagen oligomeric matrix protein or COMP, uh, which the Mulkinton lab had shown was indicative of a stable chronic scar post MI. And what we can see is that if we look at eight weeks, there's a robust accumulation of COMP with these elongated fibers that's not present in early forming scars. And so we think this environment, even if you induce an inflammatory response, might not be uh, amenable to uh, rejuvenation. So we think this could be very important going forward. Uh, but really what, I'm, what I am interested in, and I just recently moved to the University of Colorado to start my own lab. I'm interested in finding ways to harness this immune response to improve wound healing. And again, this concept of therapeutic inflammation, this idea that not only is, is immunomodulation important, but actually promoting the certain, certain features of immune cells that are beneficial to tissue healing might actually be a potential inroad for therapy. And we're interested again, in, mostly in tissue macrophages, but also other immune cell types as well. One of the things we're really excited by is looking at CX3CR1 signaling. If you recall, this is that chemokine receptor that's highly expressed on resident tissue macrophages. Uh, and it's been shown to be a marker again of this, this alternative population of cells, which are thought to have healing uh, properties although this is really still not completely understood. And so we're very interested in the signaling mechanisms of CX3CR1 and macrophages and how this re relates to cardiac wound healing. One of the reasons we're really excited by this is we found that deletion of CX3CR1 actually causes pretty remarkable cardiac defects in terms of uh, survival after MI uh, without actually changing the immune composition in terms of cell number or cell content. Monocytes, neutrophils, and macrophages are all pretty much there at the same levels. Uh, however, these, these knockout mice really respond poorly to MI and they, they seem to form uh, really in, incomplete scars. And why I think this is exciting is that these macrophages are, are still present in the heart. So our knockout system uses CX3CR1 GFP so we can still track the cells that are normally expressing this, this receptor, although here they're actually functionally null. And these knockout cells are present in the scar at equal levels. And so we think that this receptor somehow is uh, conveying important cues that when you lose it, these macrophages become somehow defective and actually uh, fail to promote proper wound healing. And so we're actively pursuing uh, this question in the lab. The other thing that we're really excited by is uh, macrophage fibroblast communication and crosstalk. I showed you that the, these differential populations of macrophages impart uh, either activating or po possibly modulatory cues on fibroblasts. Uh, we've just recently completed a, a gain-of-function crosstalk screen where we've actually developed a system where we can promote uh, novel gene expression in macrophages and culture, and then seed in fibroblasts with a collagen luciferase reporter and measure the effect of this crosstalk in terms of uh, fibrotic gene expression. So we've done this with secreted factors. Uh, we're in the process of doing this as well with other uh, novel genes and novel pathways as well. Uh, again, really interested in this concept that certain populations of macrophages might actually be able to tune fibrosis uh, in terms of ben in beneficial ways. So I'll wrap up by saying thank you to uh, everyone for attending. All the work I've shown you here was done during my postdoc with Jeff Mulkentine in Cincinnati Children. So I have to thank him as well as mem members of the lab in uh, Cincinnati. A new lab in, in uh, Colorado is currently expanding. We have one really nice uh, recruit so far, we're looking for more uh, collaborators in the university and funding support. And thank you for the invitation, uh, real pleasure. Happy to start discussion. Thank you very much for uh, this presentation of uh, a different uh, aspect and, uh, and different new possibilities for, uh, uh, for inducing cardiac regeneration. And uh, we have a number of uh, questions uh, uh, online, and maybe together with Christian, we, we will be able to, uh, to, to, to ask them. Uh, uh, on behalf of our uh, participants, I think we can uh, spend about uh, 10 more minutes on, uh, on discussion. I hope it's fine with uh, our speakers to, uh, to, to stay with us. Uh, Christian? 
Yeah, maybe maybe I, I start with the question. I mean, a lot of these uh, discussion points were relating to the role of the immune system actually in, in both talks. So in, in general, some people have pointed out that you might just use Simosan or more unspecific particles to just induce an, an uh, inflammation in the, in the local environment. Um, my question is uh, as to the character of these these resident macrophages. So, are you basically sure what what their origin is? Is that because there are different sources for for resident macrophages, and can you further specify it? And secondly, my personal question, or in in, in adding to to this, is that the CXR three one positive resident macrophages are probably, like you point out, more regulatory or alternatively activated. So you may not induce uh, an inflammatory or classic inflammatory response, but rather a regulatory response in uh, immune cell uh, subsets. And uh, so, what's basically what's your take on that? Yeah, great, great question. So the, the data that I showed does not on its own tell, you, tell us about origin. So, so we would have to use some of the lineage tracing approaches that have been used in the field to get at that, and we're doing that. Um, but really, the data I showed you really can only tell you about CX3CR1 expressing macrophages that are in the heart at the time of injury. It doesn't necessarily tell you whether they're resident or circulating. Uh, we have found, like many others, that CX3CR1 is expressed on certain monocyte subsets. It's expressed in, to some extent on T cells, certain subsets of T cells. So as a marker by itself, it's not enough. Uh, we're interested in the signaling pathways, but in terms of the origin, we're working on some other models to sort of get at that uh, higher, higher degree of specificity. Um, but again, we think a major population, not the only, but the major population is those resident macrophages that are present in the tissue uh, that do express CX3CR1. Um, there is a, most likely a contribution from monocytes and other, other pools as well. Um, the interesting thing we saw was that we're still recruiting CCR2 monocytes and macrophages. So we haven't, we haven't you know, shifted things entirely towards that reparative phenotype. Mm -hmm. It's more of the entirety of the process and you know, we think the reason that it seems to work that way is that that reparative process resolves. So you know, for whatever reason, these zymosin injections or cell injections, they get cleared from the heart. I think if they didn't, it would be a very different story. And you would have you know, a more robust uh, chronic immune response. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think the actual the, the kinetics of the response turns out to be really important. Thank you very much. And the question to Thomas is uh, related to uh, um, modifying effects of, uh, firstly, immune responses, and secondly, uh, the angiogenesis that may occur in uh, your patches uh, on, the, on the outcomes and the efficacy. Could you comment on, uh, on, on both of these? They were asked by, by various people, yeah. uh, from Maurizio Pesce from Milan and, uh, and others. Yeah, I think these are good, good questions. And I'm sure there, 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 there must be an immunological aspect in it. And it may very well relate also to, to vascularization. I mean, macrophages are very well known to be important for angiogenesis. And these data which suggest that all of these repair um, mechanisms work less well or not in, in uh, chronic injury, uh, in chronic injured heart, make the point that, that there is something in the acute healing phase which is important for, for the healing and, and probably also for the graft. For example, I mean, I, I wanted to show some data, but I, I didn't have, um, somehow <laughs> the student didn't send it in time. So we do have some recent data where we did the same thing in chronic injury. And we do see grafts, but they're only half the size. And that may very well relate to a lower angiogenic response. I, I'm not sure whether that is a reason, but that would be my, my guess. And that again could be related to the different environment in terms of um, healing. So yes, I think that is important. And that of course causes problems in terms of translating because in humans, we will not be able to, to do this in, 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 in the acute phase. It, we are all, all thinking about patients in a chronic phase. So, um, so I think it, it, it will be very important to answer the question, is it just less and you need more cells? 
and get the same graph if you use, for example, two times as, as big a uh, graph? Or is there more going on? Another and, question. Uh, what about the option of, uh, for example, modulating pharmacologically this process? So yes. uh, th there is a question on, on the question and answer about immunomodulation, but maybe some other uh, ways to enhance uh, the process uh, yes. with pharmacology. It's a, it's a good speculation. Nobody did this yet, as far as I know, to combine uh, pluripotent stem cell derived injections or patches and some, let's say, pro inflammatory intervention, which would be somehow interesting. And we, we are planning to do this experiment. I'm not aware of anybody who has done this systematically. Actually, I think Chuck Murray tried with something which was. I don't know exactly what it was, but it just caused inflammation in a nasty way. Didn't help. Um, yeah, but it's it's quite an obvious question. I would, I would be a certain caveat with, with, with that. And I also have another question. I mean, you're obviously concerned about immunogenicity and uh, generating harpo, uh, immunogenic uh, cardiomyocytes, but there's also uh, obviously uh, some physical factor of the connectivity and, and the coupling. I mean, you showed that if you inject the cardiomyocytes, you end up with only 10% left uh, after uh, transplantation um, and the effects on EF are also not, not, not convincing. And, and this is much better with, uh, with your patch. So I'm actually wondering whether if you directly inject these cardiomyocytes, you uh, uh, induce a lot of immune cell recruitment that will actually disturb this, uh, this survival cycle, rather than when you basically have a patch that is sort of in itself not fully, it seems not fully connected to the other tissue and therefore maybe, maybe preserved. And I mean, you nicely showed that you have this degeneration, regeneration cycle in your patch and maybe that doesn't occur or is deficient if you inject basically these cardiomyocytes directly and they're exposed basically to, uh, to an uh, immune environment. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think these are good thoughts. I, I, I think I have, I have no answer. I'm not sure whether anybody else has an answer. Um, maybe just as a, as a um, reminder, of course, all of these pluripotent stem cell derived myocyte injections or patch in, implantations have been done under immunosuppression. Mm -hmm. So the same mechanism which has been uh, described by uh, Ron will not apply here. So what we are seeing here is really something which is probably due to probably due to the new myocytes, even though I, I still mm. think we need a formal proof of that. But it must be another mechanism. It cannot only be um, improved wound healing, because at least it's all done under, under full immunosuppression. Mm. And of course, then it would also not apply for, for hypoimmunogenic. And, and, and another question, or, or, or at least observation in terms of coupling and, and, and connectivity is the arrhythmia, uh, arrhythmogenic potential. So, uh, and relating back to the first part, I mean, you also know that macrophages are very important in the electric uh, coupling of the, of the yes. myocyte. So once again, you know, what makes the difference between the arrhythmogenic uh, uh, cardiomyocyte injection and the patches that, that are pre preserved? Is it again sort of like a preformed cellular compound connectivity that you have in the patch that you lack basically if you directly inject it? Honest answer, we don't know. The, 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 the pessimistic answer is they do not couple and therefore they do not... Um, or well, they do not couple sufficiently and therefore don't give arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the more optimistic would be what you just said. Um, Wolfram Zimmermann always thinks about mechano-electrical coupling. There is, there is an, uh, I think, a good chance for that. I, I do think, um, and we are working on that, we have, I think, a very nice system built up to show to, 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 to demonstrate or to, to, to challenge the contribution, the acute contribution of contractility here. And let's see what, what's going on. It's, it, these are not um, finished yet, but I would like to show directly that if you do something with the contractility only of the graft, does it change something? Because that would be the ultimate proof. Mm. And yeah. we don't have it yet. Hey, I would like to ask something to Ron, because still in the end, and I think some, uh, there wasn't a question in the 
from somebody asking the same question. If there's not more my, uh, myocardium and just let's say a better, a better ECM, why do you get a change in ejection fraction? Yeah, that's that's the question we've we've been struggling with, and we don't have an answer yet. We think that some of it is is an, it's not so much an improvement; it's an attenuation of dysfunction. So, uh, I don't think that changes of the ECM are going to impart you know beneficial contractility. All it's really doing is slowing the decline, and we see some of that with comparing our acute data versus our long term data. You know, function still continues to drop off. Uh, but we think that by changing some of these early healing uh, signals and by changing some of these ECM components, perhaps the ECM is, is not as stiff or is not as, you know, not as more easily um, able to, to take part in the rest of contraction from the viable tissue. So yeah, we're still working on that. We don't think it's an active contractile sig you know, component. Uh, we think it's more of uh, you know, a bystander effect that better ECM leads to less dysfunction and sort of a sort of that, that feed forward mechanism. Uh, but yeah, we're, we don't think that this mechanism gives you a regeneration. It gives you sort of a, a, a healing, a mild healing, and it is, it's, it's time dependent. So in a chronic scar where that, that phase has passed, this mechanism is not effective. So mm -hmm. that's important too. And maybe related partially to this, uh, raised by uh, two of our uh, 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 participants, is ejection fraction really the best yeah. way of measuring the output of these studies? We, uh, this is, a, in a way, a controversial question because clinically, of course, we, we, we understand why it's used. But, uh, uh, but is, uh, is it not, if, uh, you, is using it not uh, sort of uh, discouraging us from pursuing uh, uh, certain avenues that actually might improve uh, uh, the function in the long term? And I think it's a question to both of you. Is ejection fraction the optimal uh, way? I think I referred to an article, I think it was uh, by Dr. Marian, a recent in Cirque research, a beautiful article about the value of um, uh, ejection fraction. And the answer is clear, no. Um, I'm, I'm not very, uh, I'm, I'm not too much an expert on, 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 on this cardiac mechanics, but I'm, I'm sure that there must be better ways. For example, strain, strain imaging is probably an important thing which we can do nowadays with this uh, visual sonics also in mice and, and a bit more difficult in, in, in guinea pigs because they, the, the pictures are much much less good. But, but I, I, I would say clearly no, it should, should be better. There should be better ways. It was also asked by your share with regard to the Laflamme data on, in, in chronic yeah. guinea pigs. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, Ron, what you say. I, I think it cannot be all the ejection fraction, particularly for the, for an effect you were seeing, which is not direct. It cannot directly be active force development. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it, it, it does have its uses, especially in, in rodent models and small animal models as sort of a surrogate for some of these responses. We, we also did look for remodeling indexes. We looked for changes in diastolic volume. We actually didn't see anything uh, with, these, with these cell injections. Uh, we were doing a little bit of strain analysis, but again, you know, it, it, what we're really interested in trying to do is figure out ways to measure tissue mechanics as well as functional mechanics. And so we're, we're doing some of that here in Colorado with, with uh, collaborators. And so hopefully I'll have something to say more about that. Um, certainly it's not the be all and end all. I think it, 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 it can be over, over uh, interpreted. Okay, uh, I think that uh, I, I, the question is, Christian, uh, do you think any other questions we should ask? Because uh, the, we, we are slightly delayed to our uh, program, but uh, we received a very large number of questions. And I must say that I think the best way uh, for us to, uh, to, to handle it will be uh, that our office will transfer these questions to our speakers and uh, uh, you can communicate with, uh, with some of the people uh, that have asked them directly. We tried to sort of uh, represent uh, some of the questions, but uh, taking into account the time constraints, we are unable to uh, accommodate all the, uh, all the questions, unfortunately. But I think the number of questions shows how important and controversial the topic of our seminar uh, was today. So thank you to both the speakers for really excellent presentations, for all the beautiful work that you've been doing. And maybe I will ask Christian to say a few words uh, for closing. 
Thank you. Yeah, uh, so thanks, Tom. And uh, I think, you know, this is uh, one of the, uh, yeah, I think the fifth instance of this uh, joint webinar. And I think it turns out to be a very, very good success. And I uh, think this was a prototypic example of how this works, you know, to combine the uh, um, one more senior and one more junior researcher and uh, basically let them join forces in developing the, the next the next questions and I think this is what we want to continue and uh, I think we are in a good way and see uh, how all this discussion really you know uh, uh, confirms that, uh, that this is the, the good format yeah. thank you thank you thank very you. much for joining uh, us uh, today and uh, we will be in touch regarding the next uh, uh, seminar. Uh, and we uh, are very grateful to all of you for uh, joining today. And, uh, and uh, uh, we hope to see you in about one month's time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.